the first step towards the future. A look at the impact of the Riverfront Convention Center on the future of Mobile is presented in the public interest by this station. And now, Mayor Arthur Outlaw. Hello. Thank you for tuning in today on what I believe you'll find to be a very informative program about the City of Mobile's plans to build a Riverfront Convention Center. Let me begin by telling you that when the new Mayor Council form of government came into office two and a half years ago, we started creating a strategic plan for Mobile's growth over the next eight years. During the planning process, we found strengths in the city that led us to investigating Mobile's potential in the over $300 billion a year convention and tourism industry. From there, an experienced convention consultant was hired, whom you'll meet in a moment. And that is when our work began. I know many have said we should have come to you sooner with the information we are about to present. But it is only now that we are absolutely sure that what we are doing is right for Mobile. We reached this conclusion after almost three years of doing our homework. We have spent many hours researching, investigating, and actually going and seeing for ourselves just what the convention and tourism industry can do for Mobile. And now, after all this time of dotting our I's and crossing our T's, I feel totally confident that entering into this industry is what we in Mobile need to do. At this time, I ask you to simply keep an open mind while you listen for a while to some of the nation's top convention center and downtown redevelopment experts as they help explain why and what your city is doing. For the next half hour, we'll look at some of the important issues concerning the Riverfront Convention Center and Mobile in general. Our panel of experts includes our moderator, Ward Deems, president of the Matrix Group, an independent consulting firm. Sid White, a senior associate with Economics Research Associates. Tom Ventulette, partner in charge of design with Thompson, Ventulette and Stainback Architects. Ed Fattis, president of the Architects Group, a Mobile-based firm and Richard Huffman, a partner with Wallace, Roberts, and Todd, urban planners. First, Ward Deems. In the latter part of 1985, uh, I received a phone call from the Mobile Greater Area Chamber of Commerce asking if I could come to Mobile and assess their potential for entering aggressively into the convention and visitor industry. My immediate experience was heavily involved with the development planning and design of the San Diego Convention Center and the currency of that information seemed appropriate uh, to the city of Mobile. Uh, I came to, to Mobile and I was immediately struck by the similarities between this city and several other small, smaller and larger waterfront communities with a kind of quiet, beautiful seaside, waterside orientation. And doing the assessment work, it came clear to me that the existing municipal auditorium, which was currently and is currently being used for what convention activities you do have here, and there are, there are many that go on, was inadequate to serve the city in a very meaningful way for major construction, uh, major activities in the convention business. Now, part of that assessment also looked at the nature and character of your existing downtown area. Convention centers have shown, uh, have been shown to be a very important ingredient in beginning a revitalization process which your strategic plan very enthusiastically and aggressively wish to pursue. As a part of that assessment, I recommended to the city that they immediately enter into an economic feasibility and market study in order to determine the true nature of what this particular project might be for the city of Mobile and if you should even build it at all. As a result of that, the firm of ERA, Economics Research Associates of Los Angeles, was retained after a very intensive selection process to provide that, that survey and study. ERA has an extensive background in similar convention facility analyses. It was particularly important to note in their report that the one ingredient that Mobile has that most other communities do not have who are involved in the convention center industry is a waterfront orientation. And you'll hear a good deal of it about that as we go on today. I have to also tell you that the city of Mobile in two and a half years 
has accomplished more in a solid, progressive attitude and development of, of this project than most cities accomplish in five to 10, even 15 years, because there is a real commitment here. And I think that is what I noticed and, and observed early on, is that your business community, your leadership, and many of the citizens that I contact want something to happen for Mobile. And this project offered that opportunity. And in fact, to demonstrate that commitment, the city council and the mayor, following the report from ERA, authorized the rehabilitation of your municipal auditorium and theater complex. Now, these buildings are, have a fantastically wonderful use for the future. Following that, another major issue arose relative to the development of your waterfront. And that concerned the proposed plans by the state of Alabama and the federal government for the construction of an elevated expressway along the waterfront. Early on in this study, I indicated to the mayor, the city council, and to the chamber of commerce that it would be virtually impossible to develop your waterfront in a solid, uh, uh, in a solid way, in a way that would benefit the community and the citizens of Mobile if an elevated throughway, expressway, were built separating your downtown area from your waterfront, that one unique feature that makes your downtown Mobile very, very special. And as a result of that, a concerted effort was made to convince the state uh, that alternate plans for that elevated expressway should be undertaken. As a, as a further result of the activities, the city council authorized the retaining of an architectural firm to design a new convention center. And the mayor appointed a selection committee of uh, many of your leading citizens who worked very diligently in interviewing uh, uh, 12, uh, reviewing 12 or 13 different architectural firms. We interviewed four. And out of that, a very fine team of architects uh, from uh, Mobile and Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, the architects group of Mobile, Ed Fass is here today and will be speaking to you a little later. And uh, uh, Vinch, Thompson Venchelet, Stainback of Atlanta, Georgia. Tom Venchelet is here. Highly experienced firm in design of many convention centers across the country. We are currently in the process of preparing a detailed project program and they will be presenting that program to your city uh, in the very, very near future. As a result, I think you're going to see several things happen in the near future in addition to this project. Uh, the firm of Wallace, Roberts, and Todd, who you'll be hearing also a bit about, um, is working on the urban master plan, the urban design, rather, of the, of the waterfront area. Uh, following that, there is going to be the need for the, a very comprehensive urban design and urban master plan for downtown Mobile. Now, I've been talking about downtown, downtown, downtown. Uh, there are people in the community I know who say, well, wait a minute, I don't live downtown, I don't work downtown, um, what's in it for me? I have to tell you that I think the uh, Economic Research Associates can certainly bring this out in, in full force, is that a convention center brings money to the entire community. It brings benefits to the entire community. This is not just a secular program to revitalize downtown, although certainly that is an extremely important part of your, of your future, that you have a strong, vital downtown as the heart of your community. But I know you will find, as you look into this further, that there will be benefits to the entire community that you should be well aware of. I think people don't understand that it is, it is an industry. It is not a, it's not just a building that's being built. Uh, it, there's, a, there's $83 billion spent annually in the convention and meeting business in, this uni in the United States. You don't have to get a very large market share to be successful, and yet there is competition uh, because there are centers being built throughout the country. Uh, could you comment a little bit about that competition and also then relate that to what benefits you see accruing to Mobile as a whole? I think, I think, uh, let me think about that. I think our, our analysis of the other cities surrounding Mobile really sets the stage. Uh, it's another gauge that we use to develop the market opportunities for the city of Mobile. In other words, I'm trying to, to, uh, set the stage, give the impression that our numbers are basically very conservative. All right. We didn't go out there and take a look at the market and then say Mobile is going to do a bang-up job much better than the rest of the cities in the area. Instead, we took a very conservative position for Mobile. Our numbers, as we looked at them, uh, generated 109,000 new delegates into the city of Mobile. When we then took that number and uh, generated our other economic impacts, both direct, indirect, induced, things such as new jobs, 
new service companies that would result, uh, new construction, new office buildings, new hotel rooms. Uh, it will be a shot in the arm. We think it will be a seed that will generate additional impacts for years to come. Convention centers are not uh, akin to providing just one, years of, uh, one year of jobs and economic impacts. They provide it over and over and over again. Uh, the, the economic impacts that will result from the convention center are something that you lock in, you make an initial expenditure for, you sort of cut into the, the inflation rate, and uh, you set your stage, and then you grow from there. As a finale to our economic analysis, we had, uh, based upon our established parameters of design, square footage of structure needed based, again, on delegate attendance, delegate expenditures, and so on, we began the process of site selection for a convention center in the city of Mobile. We looked at a number of sites, uh, four in particular were laid out on a matrix in which we determined that the highest opportunity for development of the convention center was on a parcel that was at the foot of Water Street along the Mobile River. The marketing advantages that we saw of that location uh, make Mobile a very special place for convention center meeting activities. The delegates are given the opportunity to come into the city of Mobile, enjoy the ambience of the Mobile River, and Mobile's downtown as it develops will provide additional opportunities for the delegates to meander about the city and uh, very importantly spend their dollars in the city of Mobile. Uh, as a result, again, we feel that the downtown will directly feel the impact of those delegate dollars. Those dollars will turn over and over again in the community. Mm -hmm. it's, it's new money. It comes into Mobile's economy. Then it's churned, as we like to call it, in the local economy, providing jobs basically in the hotel industry. The, develop, the delegates need a place to stay. In the restaurant industry, they need a place to eat. Entertainment industry, where they will go in the evenings and during the time that they're not attending conventions or other association meetings. All of these dollars then entering Mobile's economy will provide new jobs, again, permanent new jobs on an annual basis. Uh, I saw a list that we would help prepare recently of the many other businesses which are either directly or indirectly related to the convention business. As an example, uh, if hotels are built downtown, uh, they have, need laundry services. Uh, Absolutely. They need assistance in, in drage, transportation. Uh, you got the flower shops and the photographers and a whole series of things you don't think about. Um, those are, are those some of the things that would help uh, citizens throughout Mobile, not just in the downtown area? Absolutely. Convention Center is like an economic engine. It keeps churning and churning and churning over and over again. In other words, a dollar comes in to Mobile from wherever else in the United States, non-local dollar. Right. And that dollar is then touched at least two, maybe two and a half, sometimes three times by other people who have nothing to do with that original convention. Is that the turnover effect that you're talking that's, about? That's that's very correct. That's the turnover effect. That two and a half times then will create new jobs over and over again. Um, Dick, what is your impression of what makes Mobile a very special convention type community? Is there, are there some features that you've noticed? And I think Tom has some thoughts about that too. I think one of the first things that impressed me when I came here is that uh, although many of the people in the community may not realize that waterfronts are tremendous, exciting areas for visitors to a community. And a convention center on the waterfront here can take advantage of an improved investment and a relook at how that redevelopment can also help the central area of the city. Uh, we can perhaps find a way to uh, to blend this new convention and these new visitors in with the downtown itself. Uh, for example here, conventioneers who visit any community are going to want to expand beyond, uh, beyond the building itself. They, they want to actually move as pedestrians uh, into the area surrounding the convention center. Uh, here you have two benefits. The 
First is the waterfront itself and the possibilities of waterfront activities in the future and the downtown. Now the reason I keep stressing the downtown is that this location so close in can have a spin-off effect and can actually help the downtown. The pedestrians that walk from the convention center into the downtown area must be able to do so very easily, must be able to uh, uh, find it convenient and therefore it's very important that as we look at how this convention center is constructed that we find a way to make the tie to the downtown as close as it can be. Now, our experience in many other cities, notably Baltimore, Maryland, has shown that convention centers and a variety of other activities can reinforce each other and create a whole new rejuvenation. For those of you who might have visited the Inner Harbor in Baltimore and seen the tremendous tourist attractions that exist there today, you have to understand that uh, that community was in fact uh, in much worse shape than the conditions here before the commitment was, was made by the public to invest in restoring their waterfront and making that waterfront investment help out the downtown. I think that uh, the same kind of conditions exist here today and I think the opportunities also are tremendous. Tom, uh, I know as an architect you're uh, very sensitive to the uses of buildings by people and you, that's what architecture is about. Uh, you, you've expressed to me some comment about your observations about Mobile as a place. Would right. you share those with these citizens? Um, of course, I was immediately struck the first time I came to Mobile by Government Street. It's one of the most spectacular streets I've ever gone into a city through. I mean, it is an incredible experience, and it is every time I come back. But uh, I'm also struck by the very close proximity of the shoreline to downtown. It's often that uh, that actual shoreline of a river is you know, another few blocks stretched out, but this is uh, very, very close. Um, so you have a combination of, uh, as Dick said, a, a very strong, uh, easy feeling of pedestrian atmosphere that's uh, very, very pleasant uh, within the city. And at the same time, you have this immediate access to the waterfront. So when you do a building like the convention center, it needs to be convenient to, as convenient as possible to hotels and to shopping. These are the the things that people look at, as well as, of course, the facility itself, to attract them to the community. And uh, in this instance, you have those, those things working for you immediately. Everything's within walking distance, essentially, right there. Uh, the activities that can be created, the retail that's, uh, that is an offshoot to it, uh, dining and the hotel, all of these things can work together in a very convenient manner and in a close walking proximity. So the pedestrian attitude, the pedestrian linkages, the whole people uh, atmosphere that can be created is uh, th there's a positive base for that to happen. Uh, and Ed, I know that your history here is certainly a long one. Uh, would you would you give some comment about the people's attitudes about downtown and what you think uh, this po project might be uh, well, have I, uh, in store for them? I'm, I'm very excited about it, as I've mentioned. And as a teenager and a kid, when I was growing up, I lived uh, not too far from downtown. And it's very good to think that this might come back. I was pedestrian downtown uh, as in my younger years. I walked to town. We never drove to town. We were that close. And it was delightful. I still get excited at Mardi Gras and any, any activity that takes place downtown. And this whole thing just uh, really excites me and makes me look forward to it coming back. Do you think people will come back to downtown? Absolutely. Yes, sir. That's a very important aspect of this whole project. I'm sure you'd agree, Dick. You know, we talked a, a minute ago about the waterfront, its importance, its relationships uh, to downtown. Uh, yet there was a, a very serious threat to, uh, to downtown with the uh, proposed I-210 expressway. Uh, the, the attitude, I think, that the industrial nature of downtown must be preserved, and yet uh, evidence around the country shows that downtowns with waterfronts have put, put their industrial in other areas. Would you, would you comment about the I-210 uh, aspect of this, the whole traffic program and so forth? Well, I there. think what I've found across the country, and we do practice uh, all across the country in many different cities, 
I think what I've discovered is that there's a, a new progressive movement afoot in terms of highway planning. It begins to look at, uh, at highways and roads and streets as well as just freeways. It shows that investment in pedestrian is just as important as the investment in, in running automobiles. And in most of the waterfront areas that we've worked, and that includes St. Paul, that includes Norfolk, Virginia, includes Baltimore and Miami, Florida, there's always an issue of, of running the highway along the water's edge. I think that's because uh, they find that's the least resistance. That's the place where you can probably place it. And from my point of view, it's the worst place to run that kind of traffic. What you want along your waterfront is the ability to get back and forth between downtown and the waterfront. And each time you run some other form of circulation between that, you lose the tremendous benefits that already exist there. Now, when we worked in New Orleans, we were involved with a desire to place a road in between the Mississippi River and the Vieux Carre, and I think uh, most of you realize that that was a tremendously publicized effort, and mm -hmm. thank heavens we were able to uh, delay and finally totally cancel the investment in a highway in that location. I think that uh, the citizens of New Orleans are now extremely happy that the Vieux Carre and the linkage directly to the river have now been preserved and there is no highway. Well, the economic benefits that ensued from, from holding off the Vieux Carre freeway are, are, are obvious if you just go there. Um, I think the fact of, of a one-time investment, if you want to call out of, of construction dollars, is far outweighed uh, by the ongoing benefits of constructing, say, a convention center that produces income forever uh, for your city. And Tom, I know that uh, you worked in Miami and, uh, uh, of course, in Atlanta, Georgia with the World Congress Center. Uh, there's, a, there's a classic example of a situation. Could you just comment a, little bit, a bit about that aspect of, uh, of how these buildings relate to, uh, to transportation? Uh, we've got two tracks out here that people are quite concerned about, and you will be demonstrating in time how we're going to mitigate that, that program. But, uh, Atlanta uh, really had something inter interesting. Could you just comment ab about the similarities sure. of the two sites? Sure. Uh, Atlanta was a very difficult site uh, because it had railroads running right, right through the site. And the railroads are something you don't just cross over. You've got to get over the top. Uh, the convention center first sat between two sets of railroads uh, on both sides. So we had to get pedestrians over the top of those. And uh, you would actually enter the upper level and go down into the convention hall. And it works. Uh, people don't really realize some people like to watch the trains go by underneath them. So the expansion uh, then is on an, the other side of one of the other railroads. So we had to go over that railroad as well as under the railroad uh, in both instances. So uh, we understand the problem, but uh, uh, you have a railroad here. But I think that uh, we can turn that, uh, we hope, into an advantage because it is sitting at grade. It's not something that's a visual obstruction. And, it, in a sense, it can be a physical obstruction, but we can take people up and enter into the hall and then give them at that same time a, a very special view, a panorama view back toward the city as well as uh, certainly to the water. So we'll turn that into an advantage. It's quite different, however, from a highway. A highway is a uh, raised highway, uh, is a visual and physical obstruction. Oh, it becomes part of your front door. That's right. And, and, uh, and, the, and the atmosphere underneath these uh, raised highways is uh, it's not very tolerable to a human being, I think. Right. You don't see much happening that's very pleasant there, and nothing will grow underneath them. Including people. What we're all trying to do here is leverage private investment. And I think that th an important thing to know is that highways rarely leverage private development in the central city. Convention centers generate it. And I think that if, if that point can be made, that's fact, it. fact, to the contrary, uh, highways have a tendency of reducing private investment. I think that uh, once outside interest is expressed, uh, sooner or later the owners of some of the properties that are already here will start to reinvest in their buildings. And this kind of dynamic is what everybody looks for in central cities. That's, that's an extremely important point, Dick, because your, your whole idea about an I-210 as an example, a raised expressway not inducing private development, this project has a very great need for private development. For instance, and this is certainly a part of your report, said uh, the development of 800 to 1,000 additional hotel rooms, which do not exist now, would be an incessant ingredient. How about other things that would be happening in, 
in Mobile, as you see, uh, the, the Fort Condi area as an example, or rehabilitation of downtown buildings? Well, I think, again, getting back to the leveraging effect that we talked about, putting the public dollars into the ground first to give the private development community an indication that the city of Mobile is serious about their community, is willing to invest those public dollars to give the private market a feeling of security almost. I mean, you're laying the basis with the public dollars. You're making the private development community feel comfortable. You're decreasing their risk, shall we say. They will look to areas that are adjacent to the Convention Center for Opportunities, like Fort Condi, like, for instance, the Battle House Hotel, like some of the other downtown office building locations. Those spaces then will provide additional opportunities at a level of risk that will generate the private investment. Well, we recently heard on our visit to Baltimore, as a result of it, that Baltimore saw $1 billion worth of uh, in reinvestment in the downtown area and especially along the Inner Harbor, as I recall, their convention center is around 120,000 square feet, not terribly larger than what we're talking about here. That's um, right. Edward, I think that, that that example is a really interesting one because mm -hmm. economists tend to be a little bit conservative when they do their estimates. In Baltimore, the economists suggested that maybe if they build a convention center and maybe if they redid the Inner Harbor, they could get one, maybe two additional hotels. At last count, they had nine. They were moving toward 11 hotels. What about your local development community here? Do you see them responding to this? Um, Ward, I do. Um, we have already, since the community knows that we are involved with this project, they, uh, uh, we get phone calls from developers uh, wanting to know, is it really going to happen? You know, and this sort of thing. I tell them, of course it's going to happen. Tom, some comments have been made around the local area here concerning hurricanes and the, their effect on buildings. Uh, you certainly have been dealing with those kinds of, of, of structures in the southeast for many, many years. Give us, give us your sure. response to those uh, concerns. Sure. I grew up in South Florida, and we were doing a convention center there in Miami mm -hmm. Beach. Wow. And so you're looking at a building that's a block away off the ocean. But, you know, that's a block away difference whether it's a block away or whether it's right on the ocean, you've got the same kinds of wind load problems, you've got the same kind of tidal conditions to be concerned about, you have the same thing here. And uh, you just design for it, that's all. It uh, doesn't scare me a bit to have it right where we're talking about, right on the waterfront, as opposed to being inland somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the advantages uh, are so great that uh, it's just part of the design process. Well, certainly the last 50 years have been some some significant improvements in codes and uh, in structural design that that really isn't the problem it was, say, 50 years ago. Oh, I certainly. Yeah. The codes are the same, whether you're inland or yeah, whether you're right on the water. So. That's right. Well, I hope this gives us a bit of a perspective of what, we, um, uh, what we're all facing with this project, the potential for Mobile, and, 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 and kind of the wonderment of seeing a town come back alive again with a new spirit. Uh, I know this whole team is extremely excited about it, and we look forward to uh, more of this. Once again, Mayor Outlaw. Hello again. Thank you for tuning in to this program. I hope you have listened carefully to the facts presented by the city's expert on our Plan Riverfront Convention Center. I hope these facts have helped you understand that our decision to proceed with the plan has been based on over two years' worth of in-depth research. I hope also that these experts have helped to show you that the Convention Center alone will not revitalize Mobile, but that it and the entire convention and tourism industry can act as a catalyst for the redevelopment of all the city of Mobile. We've tried to share with you as much information on the basis of our plans as time will allow. Should you want any additional information, my office is available to speak on this subject to any civic group or organization you may be a member of. Just call my office for details. Again, thank you for listening to our message. I hope you have a nice day. This program was pre-recorded.